Okay, let's uh, get started. Uh, the first thing I want to do is I need to turn in the midterm uh, mark, I guess, by this evening. So this is what I plan to do. I don't know whether you've seen it. On the model, I have a current standing, and I keep updating it uh, periodically. Uh, but what I did last night was to develop a weighted average of the marks based on the three assignments and one midterm exam. Okay, so the summary column that you see here would be 40% worth of the course so far. So the assignments are worth 20%, midterm is worth 20% each. So we have had one midterm and 20% are kind of distributed among the three assignments, but it will be distributed among about eight assignments in total for the end of the course. And uh, then it developed the weighted average using those weightings and uh, it sorted it out. I don't have any, so you need to figure out where you are from your own marks and uh, uh, this is fairly, because we are not a large class, uh, unique signature, I think, so you can know where you are. And uh, I wanted to take a moment to explain how I will do the grading. Um, it's basically, in the, course, the end of the course, I'm going to do the same thing. I'll have a graded average of all the things that we have done. Okay. And then the on the summary column, I'll take the look for grade points or differences that are significant enough. So I don't have 90, 80 as a cutoff. The cutoff is going to be slightly adjusted. Uh, using reasonable interpretation. So in this case, for example, uh, 89 and above, I said, is A. 89 is close enough to 90. And then there is a big difference between 86 and 89. So I start B at 86 and down. And uh, go down all the way to 75. And then C would be below that. And uh, the D here doesn't mean that it's going to translate into a D in the final, but it is in your hands. You need to work hard. So it's basically a flag that there are some issues for some students. So either the midterm performance is very bad, or assignment mark is not there. At this stage, this is actually a big challenge. The level is still in that stand. It would have gone to about 70 or so. And another rational would be, for example, not only there is a big difference, but also there's a big difference in the breakdown. So when I'm deciding on these breakpoints, I will take a number of factors into account. Your classroom participation and the performance in each of the exams individually. Uh, if there is an A thing in one exam, but there is another exam, but you are near the border, I will try to push you over the border. Okay, so. That's, that's basically the rationale that I would uh, use. Any questions or comments on that? I will keep updating this after the midterm, second midterm, I'll put it up again so that you know where you are. Let's put a feedback mechanism for those who are in the bottom of that uh, ranking to pay a little bit more attention so that you can bring your thing up. And if everybody is above a certain level, I will not have any D. But if it continues, there will be. Uh, Okay, uh, I guess a number of you have talked about the pace of the course, and uh, so I got uh, some requests to slow down and do a lot of examples between now and the second midterm in terms of uh, preparing you for the second midterm. I've already been doing it, uh, examples in the last two lectures. I will continue that. And in fact, I will not post the solution in the lecture notes. Okay, so last night I made up a few problems 
and we will discuss the problems together and we will try to solve it in the class. So there is some space that I have left in the notes that you may want to add the solution. Okay, any questions or comments for me? Did I have not recorded this? In the last lecture, we did the second of a series of problems where we looked at the dynamical response of the measuring instrument alone. And uh, so we kind of went off the track, but an important thing that came out is, uh, and I'm highlighting this here because we should be able to answer questions like that in an exam, uh, the relationship between a pure dead time delay uh, as you will find in a pipe, and a first order process, a delay that is introduced by a first order process. And uh, why did, we, for example, we accidentally saw that they were matching with each other when the time delay was very small? And you should be able to understand it and derive such kind of uh, approximation uh, using the pattern approximation. Um, so what I want to do today is put all of these elements together. So two lectures ago, we looked at this part of the process, the relationship between the inlet temperature perturbation and the tank temperature response. In the last class, we studied in detail the dynamic response of the measuring instrument alone, which introduces a small delay. Now I want to put all of them together, and I want to do this in two ways, uh, preparing you. The problem is self space, do it by simulating. So we will do it by simulink, um, and then we will also try to do it by hand, at least develop the effective transfer function so that you can then fill in the rest of the part of inverting it, uh, doing partial fractions and things like that. Okay. Uh, yeah, the other request I had was for practice problems. So on the website I have posted again this morning uh, a sample past midterm exam from the previous year, from the last year. Okay, I'm not going to post the solutions to that. And uh, if you are solving it, you can come and hear it. Is. Okay, sample midterm exam from the past. Um, but don't ask me. For, don't ask me to post the solution. The idea is to trigger you to look at it and solve it by yourself. And if you solve it, you can come and discuss it with me if you have any questions. Okay, so let's. Um, understand the problem. The problem is to the tool find the response, find the dynamic response of a complete closed loop system for a controller gain of 20. Okay? So there is a controller which is a proportional controller. Okay? A proportional controller and this is the heater. And the heater has a simple gain of 1 over WC as we saw. And then this is the process uh, transfer function and the measurement time function. And it's a closed loop feedback system. So we are measuring the temperature and feeding it back and comparing it against a set point. Okay, so what we are going to do is we, are, we can do different set point changes. Okay, so we can, uh, uh, this particular problem talks about uh, a set point change uh, of phase. I think you are not really given that, right? Let's take that uh, at 10 degrees C. I have given you to try on your own the detailed steps. I don't want to go through that in the class. You can study that from the notes. But let's just go through the process of building it and then solving it by developing an effective transfer function. Okay, so if I am going fast, please do stop me. But I don't think I'll go fast in building this. It's going to take a while. <laughs> Okay, so I need two transfer functions, one for the process and one for the measurement instrument. So I put in the process, one for the measurement element, 
and then I need two gains. Gains are just what is a gain? The relationship between the input and output is a scalar okay. multiple. This is a constant, either it increases or decreases. Okay. And uh, you can obviously put a time function and put the time constant as zero. So it'll be equivalent to the gain. But there is something called a gain block in uh, in Simulink, which has a different symbol. If we can find it. There it is. Gain. Okay. So I'm going to use two of them, one feeding into the other, and one is for the controller. So proportional controller. Okay. So proportional controller has uh, the what is the main equation for the proportional controller? The output is proportional to the error proportional to the error okay so the error is going to be uh, determined from the summation okay math operation okay so what else do I need? A source and a sink. A source is going to be a step change. There and then a sink. Sink is of course. Okay. So I've any questions on that? I've looked at what the transfer function I mean, what the block diagram looks like, and I've identified all the units. And here, I go, of course, I put a sim out also. If you want, we can add that. But all the basic elements that I need, I have assembled on my uh, workspace. So I just need to connect them up. Okay. Uh, so let me connect this to the screen. This may be too slow for you guys. I don't know really how to strike a balance. Uh, I don't have a good mouse on my. Pardon me? No, okay. <laughs> All right. Which one? The for the game? No, you were trying to get practice. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the transfer, the output from the transfer function is the temperature, which I want to rotate to the scope so that I can see the temperature. Uh, yeah, I, I need to sample that and measure the temperature, right? So I need to do this. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you, thank you. I need to transfer, uh, put this back. What is the way to transfer, put this back? Okay, that is the way to put this back, but I don't know. <laughs> I, I need to connect this part yeah. to that. Okay. Okay, and then I need to take this and connect it to that. Uh, 
Okay. It's a convoluted way of doing it. So this is a way to fill the child to function so that also from this is the input and input is from this side and input is from line. But uh, the logical flow is the important one. That's where I made the mistake. Okay. So I was trying to connect the output to the sample, but I need to take the output and feed it to the uh, summation. Now this one I want this to be plus minus. By default it has plus plus. Okay. So let me change this to plus minus. Okay. So that is the one that's going to take the difference between the set points. Here I put the set point G and I take the difference between the measure and the set point. That would be the error. If there is an error, the error signal will go and it's fed into the proportional controller. Okay. So here I'm going to put a gain, not a one, but I'm just going to call it as K. So K, if I put a symbol like this in my stimulation, then I need to define that in the workspace, in the MATLAB workspace. Okay? And uh, this gain is going to be uh, 1 over WC, which is, um, I guess I had it uh, incorrectly there, I think, 1 over 14 on the right from the last slide. So 1 divided by 14. Okay. And uh, this one was 5s, tell me? Yeah, 5s. So I need to change this coefficient to 5 in the denominator. Okay, And this one is 0.33. I need to change the coefficient of that to 0 0.33. Okay. And uh, that's it. So I can put a step change, a unit step change at the time of 0, for example, and run the simulation. What was the error? It didn't define k. So if you had any symbols that you have used in your uh, simulating block but that is not defined by a value, then as it executes, it looks for the value in the workspace. Okay. So what you need to do is go to the workspace, that is the MATLAB uh, command window, and define k is equal to 20. Okay. And then go back and redo the simulation. Did I use the lowercase k? Make it an upper case K. Okay. That is the response. Okay. Question, yeah. Right. Um, the reason for the two are I guess I need to go back um, to this diagram. This was the diagram that we developed two lectures ago. Okay. Um, that represents the three dimensional world. So this is the tank. And the tank can have a disturbance in the inlet temperature. Okay. And the Q that is coming here is the heater for the tank. Okay. So the heater, uh, when you look at the balance, that uh, energy balance equation will have uh, a constant, which is 1 over WC. Maybe we need to go to the previous lecture and look at that equation. Then you will understand. Yes. There are many ways of doing it. You can put a transfer function and put the time constant as 0. The numerator as the number that you want. Then it will also represent a multiplication. But gain has only the constant, nothing else. Yeah, this is the equation I want to look at. Okay, so this equation relates the output temperature T prime to Q, the heat duty, which is one of the input, 
and Ti prime, which is the inlet temperature. So there are two excitations for the process. Either you can change the inlet temperature Ti, which will change the outlet temperature, or you can change Q, which can change the outlet temperature. So there's a summation term here. So basically, we, we, and we saw that we can write this in uh, many different ways, by factoring it either in this form that you see here or in the next form that you see here. Either one of them. Okay. If I write it as a second form, then I will have, uh, in both cases, I will have 1 over 14, 1 over WC. That goes with the heating, Q. Okay. That's the reason for, so, th that's the reason for that gain block, 1 over 14. But let me ask you a question. Um, in the block that I have written, do I have the ability to change Ti prime? Ti prime is what? Ti prime is an inlet temperature. That could be a disturbance. Right? And if I want to do that, where would I put it? Have I done it in the first place? Obviously, you don't see it there, right? So, how would I put it? These are the variations that could be there in an exam. Okay? So, you have seen a problem and you say, I now consider uh, the combined effect of a natural disturbance from the inlet stream and the set point change. Well, how would you change this diagram? Um, Here. But what is coming out here is T prime, the outlet temperature. This is the process, right? So what is coming is the outlet temperature which you are measuring from the thermocouple, right? So look at the equation. That is coming. No, in this diagram, uh, this is the process. Okay, this is the measuring element. This is the heater. This is the controller. The controller is simply a proportional controller. So the signal that the controller is going to send to the heater is proportional to the error. Right? So when, it's, when the controller receives an error message, it says, OK, I need to increase the heat input to the tank or decrease the heat input. So it's going to send a signal out. OK? So currently, the flow of logic, make sure that you understand the flow of logic, OK? So what is happening is everything is built around the process. You are measuring it and sending it to the comparator. Comparator compares against the set point and sends out a signal, error signal. The error signal is interpreted by the controller. You can replace this block by a PID controller. There is a built-in PID block also. I'll show you, for example, maybe let's take this out and put a PID, OK? And the PID controller sends an action. It receives an error, sends an action to the final control element. In this case, the final control element is the heater. Okay? So the heater says, okay, I'm going to dump so much of uh, kilowatts or kilojoules of energy into the process to bring it back to the temperature that I want. Now, in the whole process, I have not included in this particular diagram a disturbance, whereas in the di diagram that I showed you, the most general one here, I have the disturbance. So if I have to translate this into the similar length lock, I need to include uh, the effect of Ti prime, the change in the peak temperature, which is here. So where would I put that stream, and how would I construct that? That's what I want you to think about. This kind of looks very similar to what we have on the similar length, right? So the question is, where would I put Ti prime? And now moving in the right direction. Now you're saying after the here. You have to put in an add block, but would you put it here or would you put it there? That depends on the form of factoring that takes place. Okay. So the way that we have written the equation here. Um, Ti prime plus 1 over 14 Q. Okay? If you add them, and then both of them are sent to this 1 over 5s plus 1 block. Okay? 
So if you choose to use this one, then I should put it where? After after the heat is gained, right? Because 1 over 14, that signal is multiplied by uh, Q, okay? And then after that, I put the I5. And add them, and the sum of them goes to the, um, the, pro the process. Okay? So I need to open this up, add an add block, something like this, and then uh, add a string from the top, which will be TI prime. Okay? So I'm not going to do that. I'm going to kind of uh, ask you to explore that on your own. Now, going back, any questions on this? Going back to this, I accept a unit step change, didn't I, in temperature. What do we notice on this diagram? It goes to about point, point six. It goes only to 60% of the step change I wanted. Why is that? Because it's only a proportional controller. Okay. So if I want to bring it closer to 1, so the proportional controller through analysis we saw very early in the course always has an offset. To remove the offset, you can add the integral action or you can try to force the proportional action to go closer. So what would I have to do? This is why I split it and put the k in the here so that I can change it. What, I, what happens if I put k equals 100? You get closer and closer. But it'll never reach. It'll reach that only if k is infinity. Uh, we'll see. We'll see. What do you think should happen? Should it slow down or should it increase it? it speed up because it's amplifying the error signal. So the error signal is small. It says I'm going to add a lot more heat. Uh, so the response is cut down, but Consequences, it has an overshoot. Okay, overshoot. Now, should a push out of system be like that? That's it. Sorry, it, it, it overshoots its own steady state. Yeah. Not, the, not the step change, right. But the response has an overshoot over its, its own steady state. Okay. Um, but we know that the first order process should not have an overshoot, right? Why is there an overshoot? Because it's not the first order process. Even though the process itself is first order, remember this is first order, when we put it together, the net, the net response, what we are looking at is the response between the outlet temperature here and the set point here. So we need to learn. This is what I'm going to test you in an exam because I don't test you on Simulink. So you should be able to generate a, such a graph by hand. So you should be able to assemble the effective transfer function between T prime and the outlet and T R, the set point. Okay? And you have done it in your first midterm exam. So it's basically the same thing. You're going to repeat it one more time on how to develop such algebraic expression. Uh, because of the measurement, yeah. So a good question. Type of response. So even when KT is equal to 10, it has the potential. This, this is like saying uh, a quadratic function can look like a linear function if we had AX squared plus BX plus C. A is very, very small, approaching 0. Okay, a quadratic function can look like a linear function, but when I bring the A magnitude of A up, it shows its true quadratic form, right? So something like that is happening. Well, that's a good question. So let's go and say I'm going to change this to 0. I don't know that I can. I'm allowed to do that in Simulink. <laughs> Let's try that. So what am I doing now? 
I'm removing that time variable. So what should I expect? The overshoot should go away. Right? I still call it overshoot because it goes over it. But let me see whether it does. Right. So these are the kind of interpretations that is more important. One, one, one important thing is how to do these things. The more important thing is what do they mean? How do, do I, does it make sense? Okay. It's important to understand that. Any other questions? Now, let me put this back and Now I want to get rid of this and put in an integral action because I want to, this is not part of the question that they have asked. Okay. So I'm just going to see if I put an integral action, can I get rid of the offset? Can I bring it to 1? The steady state should be 1. Okay. Because of the proportional only action, I'm not getting that. So let me go to this and type CID that I have a PLD controller. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> she said the gain of what? The controller? Uh, good question. What is what does it mean when it's k okay, equal to zero? Nothing happens. It's as if you are serving the loop there. It's multiplying zero by the error, so it produces no output. No, oh, you want to look at the response the previous part, okay? Uh, the previous part is when I make a change either in Q or in TI, what is the outlet response? So we are just looking at, that is called the open loop. Yeah, you're right. That, that is called the open loop uh, response. It's as if you are severing the feedback mechanism. You can sever the feedback mechanism by putting K equal to zero here or by putting this gain as equal to zero, okay? Now, if you put a zero, the signal doesn't pass through. If you put a one, the signal passes through. Okay, whatever is the input, output is the same as the input. We can try what happens to see if you put the sig uh, signal in zero. But I think what it should do is it should it's equal to cutting the thing there. Okay, and uh, so there is no change, so it should just remain at zero. Even though you put a step change, the effect of the step change is not felt on the heater and on the process. So the process, remember, we have defined this in terms of deviation variable, so it should remain at zero. Nothing should happen. That's what they would expect. But we can try it here. Let's try it first, in fact. So put proportional. Yeah. For any value of k, there will always be the offset. And the offset will become smaller and smaller as k becomes larger and larger. To really understand this, we need to go back to one of the earlier lectures where we derived, and we had 1 over k in the expression. So you want k to go to infinity, so that the offset, offset is proportional to 1 over k. So the uh, offset to go to 0, offset is being measured as the difference between the steady state and the final desired steady state. Okay? To drive that to 0, then you need to have k going to infinity. Okay? Um, now, what is the PI? I'm going to put the derivatives here. I'm just going to look at this one has all three of them, P, I, and B. Do you remember the transfer function for the P and I part? If you don't remember it, can you get it from, let's see whether MATLAB has a reminder for us. Normally, it has a remainder at the top here, P plus I over F plus DF. Okay. 
So that is the tensor function for a PID controller. Okay. So P is the proportional gain, and I is the integral time constant, and D is the derivative time constant. Okay. So the derivative time constant is put to zero, and um, let me put this also zero. So what am I saying in this case? No control action. That's the kind of thing that you wanted to do. I don't know what's going to happen, but let's try. You see anything happening there? Zero. Just stays there, zero, as we expected. Even though I put a step change, the error signal going to the controller at the unit step change, the controller is not acting because proportional action is turned off, integral action is turned off, derivative action is turned off. So the signal that is coming out from this is zero. And that multiplies this, so the input to the process is zero, so the process is not changing, so it is staying at, at the steady state. But why is it zero? Because we've done it in terms of the deviation variable, there is no deviation. Okay. Now, if I put 10, and an integral action of 1, what should happen? What is happening? Normal first order. That's why, but is it going to steady state? Why? That, that's all the answer is. The answer is, if you let it, it's not reach the steady state. The response is a bit more sluggish. And so you need to increase the time of simulation, say to 30. Still not enough, but it hasn't plateaued. Okay, so probably need to do for 300. There we go. It does go to the one. Okay, so the integral action will get rid of the offset that you have. Any other questions on this problem? Can you increase the gain of those steps or provide an overview with respect to more aggressive? Ah, that's a good question. I don't know the answer. Um, I think what would happen is the increasing the gain would cut down the response time. It's quicker. But will it, will it overshoot? The potential to overshoot is there because it is potentially a second order problem. If we have made it look like a first order problem by putting this time constant a very small one. If I increase that, I can make it e easily into a second order one. Okay. Um, but without it, if I put 100, <laughs> it did. It just it reached seriously so quickly. <laughs> um, Hard to tell, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. This is the function of a control engineer to find those three constants. Most of the units and chemical plants are PAD controllers, so your job would be to understand the process and its dynamic response and tune the constants, uh, the KC, the proportional constant, integral constant, etc. Okay, any other questions? All right, so how do we do this by hand in an exam? This is what you need to know when you go to the industry because they use such tools all the time, like control station, for example, commonly used one. MATLAB is also very commonly used. But for an exam, you don't want me to test it in that case. <laughs> and that's how I mean. So how do I, the, the goal now is to develop the effective transfer function between T prime and T R prime. Let me just put prime there. Okay. The output and the input. What is this effective transfer function? Given this block diagram. Okay. And uh, let me just represent these as uh, symbols, and then we can substitute the transfer function. So I'm going to call this as GP, process transfer function. I'm going to call this as GM, the measurement transfer function. And I'm just going to call this as GQ and GK for the controller. OK? 
Okay. So, and let me just put some symbols in between. Um, let me call this as x1 and this as x2. That is the link between gk and gq, I'm calling it x1. Between gq and t prime, I'm calling it x2. And this is defining my streams and I'm defining the blocks so that I can now write down a system of uh, relationships between the input and the output with the goal of getting the eventual relationship between the input and the output. The output is p prime, the input is p r prime. The set point change. If I give you a piece of paper, how many of you can do it now? Would you like to try? Shall we have a quiz on the spot? You do it and then leave it to me. <laughs> You'll end up with it? Right. So it looks like it's an interdependent system. Okay. So it's going to get you a couple set of equations when you write down all the equations, and you need to solve that. Solve that for t prime in terms of t r prime. And this algebra of the block is a very powerful one to learn. But similarly, it kind of makes it redundant because you don't need to do this algebra because you can just represent whatever the complicated blocks are. But when you're doing it by hand, you need to get an effective transfer function, which you can then use I Laplace or Laplace table to invert and get the time uh, domain. Okay, so let, let's do it, but uh, help me write down at every stage. I want to re uh, relate, and I'm going to call this as uh, the error. So every line that I have should have a symbol so that I can relate. And I should put a symbol for this Tm. Okay. So going around the loop, for example, I start here. This carries a signal of T prime, the actual process temperature. So this one will have the same thing, T prime. It goes through a block which transfers the signal to Tm. So what is the relationship between the input and output around this block? Tm is equal to Gm times T prime. Okay, that is the transfer function. Okay, now uh, what is the relationship between T prime and X2? T prime is equal to Gp times X2. What is the relationship between X2 and X1? So X2 is equal to Q times X1. Am I going fast? Okay. So what is the relationship between X1 and Epsilon? X1 is equal to GK times Epsilon. Okay. Now what is the relationship between Epsilon and TR and TM? Exactly. I guess I should put prime in every place to indicate that it's a <laughs> I'm sloppy now, right? That it's a deviation variable. Okay. So there we have all the equations relating the input and the output. But what I want is I want to get rid of all the intermediate inputs and outputs because I don't care for them. I don't care for x1 or x2 or tm. I want to relate only t prime to tr prime. So it's just an algebraic manipulation of all these equations. No matter how complicated the block diagram gets, you can do the same thing. Relate the input to the output around each block, and uh, then write down a set of. Do you have a question? Yeah, I, I was just sloppy. I should put a prime everywhere to indicate that it's a deviation variable. It looks like it's not going to work out, right? It does. It looks like No, no, let's do the algebra. The algebra is really not magical, okay? Once you write it down, you'll see that it's not really. But the goal is, the first step is to relive all the input output on every block. The, the next goal is to get rid of all the intermediate inputs and outputs that you don't care. Focus. I could ask you to develop a relationship between T and prime and T are prime. You should be able to do that because you are basically solving for all these 
variable. One depends on the other, and in this case, it looks like it depends on kind of an infinity loop. Okay, but once you write it down, you'll find that you can eliminate all the intermediate variables. So let's start. For example, um, we know that t prime is equal to g p times x two. But what is x two? g q times g q times x one. What is x one? g k times epsilon. What is epsilon? p r prime minus p r prime. You understood what is happening there? All I was doing was just substituting. Take x2 and plug it in there. Take x1 and plug it in there. Take epsilon and plug it in there. Okay? So I get the output p prime in terms of this expression. Okay? What do I do next? Well, I need to get rid of, I want to keep in my expression only p prime and tr prime. Everything else I want to get rid of. So I have tm here. So I'm going to write this as gp, gq, gk, and CR prime minus what is TM prime? GM T prime. Now what do I do? You see the feedback, the effect of feedback is dependent of the outlet temperature on itself. That is what, how does it manifest itself in the equation? T prime appears on both sides of the equation. So what do you do? You solve for it. You collect the two terms and solve for it. Okay. So we're going to write this as um, T prime times one. Uh, this is minus, so this is going to become plus uh, GP, GQ, GR, GM. If I make a mistake, correct me. Okay. G P G Q G K T K. Sorry, <laughs> I didn't read my own. This is why I refuse to write. <laughs> I cannot read my own handwriting. It is G K here, and that is G K multiplied by G M. Okay, and that is equal to G P G Q G K times T R prime. What do I need? I need the ratio of T prime over T I prime. to solve for it. Okay? So now I can write, except I don't know where I have P pocket here. T prime divided by T R prime is equal to G P G Q G K divided by one plus G P G Q G K. Oh, did I miss a GM somewhere? There yeah, yeah, G M. That's it. So now what you can do is go into Simulink and just put this one particular block that relates to input to output. Because you know each one of them. You know that GP, GQ, GK, GF, they're all defined. So that is the effective transfer function relating the output T prime to the set point change T R prime. Okay. Now this product of G prime, GQ prime, GK prime is nothing but the product of this, this, and this. And that is called the open loop transfer function. So if I cut it, cut the feedback, okay, then the relationship between T prime and T R prime is what? If there is no feedback, if I cut this out, what is the relationship between T prime and T R prime? Simply that's right. So just the product of all the three types of functions in between. So that is a kind of a non-interacting system in series, right? So you can multiply all three of them, and that is called the open loop part. Okay, that appears in the numerator. Whenever there is a feedback, and you will see see this structure appearing all the time, it is always divided by one plus that open loop transfer function multiplied by what is in the return path, okay? Which is GM in this case. Okay. That's a common structure that will occur very often. Okay. Now I can substitute. I think I'm almost out of time. But, uh, okay. Now I can substitute whatever the numbers I have for GP, GQ, and GK. In this case, for the process, I'll get one over five s plus one. 
multiplied by 1 over 14, multiplied by 20, divided by 1 plus 1 over 5s plus 1, multiplied by 1 over 14, multiplied by 20, multiplied by 1 over 0.33s plus 1. Okay. Now you can simplify it in an exam. You should be able to do that. And what will you get out of this? One times a function, but what will be the order of it? Okay. It will be a second order. So this a quadratic, I expect you to be able to do, right? So you should do partial fractions, invert it, and all those things that you should be able to do. Okay. To and in that expression, you will have this appearing. So you can just leave it as k, the process, uh, the proportional gain, and then ask the question. As I change k, how does the dynamics response change? Okay. Did I rush through again? <laughs> oh, oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, I forget. The screen resolution is not right. Is it? Oh. <laughs> Maybe I will save all these scribblings and post it <laughs> on the on the morning. Okay. Is this page okay? Question. Uh, What have you achieved? <laughs> yes, yes. I just write all the times of functions that are given, so I get an effective times of function, which relates the output p prime to the set point change. Now I can invert this by looking at the Laplace table and get the in the time domain what the dynamic response is going to be. I can answer questions on stability. If I have to ask you to say, well, is the slow slope system stable, what would you do? Find the characteristic roots of the denominator. So you'll get a quadratic essentially at the bottom. So you should solve the quadratic. Those will be your two eigenvalues. Now, of course, there's a matrix problem here. It's just a polynomial. But they showed you there's an equivalence between the matrix problem and the polynomial. Again, if any of these don't make sense, next time catch me. Okay, uh, but I'm kind of hoping that you will remember everything that we have seen and be able to put it together. Well, if you leave it as k and then simplify this expression further, what you will get is you will get a quadratic equation in the denominator. And a linear equation, I think, in the numerator that will have k in it as a symbol. And this is the output input. So you can say for various values of k, what happens to the response? Why does, for example, the time response is faster if you increase k? Now, in single link, we saw that that's what happened, but we don't know why. But by looking at the analytical expression, you'll be able to understand why. That K will appear in both ta effective tau and beta for a second order system. So changing that will affect, and that's why you're getting some, this kind of an overshoot. I think there's another class here, so let's uh, <laughs> leave. Um, but if you have any questions on this, please note it down. The next lecture, the beginning, we will take time to explain those things. I'm sorry. You will be able to make a plot. If you want me to do it, next time I'll show you how to do that. But in an exam, I'm not going to ask you to generate a plot. But you should be able to do it 
uh, by going to MATLAB or Excel or something. What is important in exam I'll ask you to do is develop the function, the time domain solution. So maybe I'll take the inverse, go to the time domain, and then analyze. Like, uh, for this journey, how long does it take to respond to a 90% steady state? Things like that.